Right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the latest uh, public lecture that NCLAS has, has on offer for this uh, end of semester, I suppose you could say it. Before we get going, I, I need to uh, acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands that we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Um, and what I would like to do is sort of extend a hearty welcome for, to Dr. Rolando Ochoa, who's joining us today to talk about uh, some of the, the issues related to the, uh, the drug cartels in Mexico. If you follow Latin American issues, which I'm assuming most of us do in one form or another, um, it's something you haven't been able to avoid. So we're, we're very lucky to have Rolando here with us, who is one of the world's leading experts on this area and has sort of a, a it's one of these sort of bits of fortuitous luck that Australia seems to keep running into that uh, there's not a lot of Latin Americans here, but they're getting the really good ones. Um, Rolando's got a uh, BA from the University Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico and an MPhil and a DPhil from the University of Oxford. He's currently a, uh, a senior research uh, a senior researcher with the Griffith University Asia Pacific Center for the Prevention of uh, Crime, and he's also an ANCLAS senior associate here. So we're very very lucky to have him associated with ANCLAS to, to deepen what we're doing. Previously, he's been a uh, a researcher with a number of leading international cen centers on crime and criminology, including the International cen Center for the Prevention of Crime, the Centre International de Criminologie Comparée, and the Centro de Investigaciones do Docencia Económicas. He's also in the past uh, worked with a, a major political figure in Mexico, Jorge Castaneda. And uh, conversations with you and with, with your wife Tracy, uh, you've got, still got quite good connections with what's going on in Mexico. I'm not going to go into a, a long catalog of his publications, but the list of publications and conference papers, research reports, and presentations are very, very impressive. Um, one from my past that jumped out in particular was the work that he's done with INCAF, uh, which is the International Network on Conflict and Fragility, which if those of you who don't know about it, if you're doing anything with failed and fragile states, um, INCAF is the one who sets the agenda uh, and pretty much leverages the cash. So to be inputting into that means you're, you're pushing on billions of dollars in program. Um, one of the things, but before we turn to Orlando and I turn the floor over to him because as you know this is an ANCLAS event and we always have a large volume of things going on, I just need to do a, sort of a quick preview of what we have coming up. And on Thursday, for those of you interested in film, we have the last film in the Argentine Film Festival and it's uh, Leandro Fabio's 1993 film Gatica El Mono, The Monkey, and that's going to be in Manning Clark Lecture Theatre 2 at 6.30. And then pushing more into the area where ANCLAS is going in public policy and direct engagement with public policy questions. On Monday, June 24th, we have a forum on the Pacific Alliance, which will include the four ambassadors from the Pacific Alliance countries, which is uh, going south to north, um, Chile, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico. Um, Costa Rica, apparently, maybe, and not quite, but mm, we don't have an ambassador in country. So. And that, unfortunately, for those of you who can't get work to send you to it, is uh, going to be start at 9 a.m. and go to 11.30 uh, AM in the Alan Barton Forum, which is, you know, the big shiny glass business building. It's on the second floor of that building there. So now without further ado, um, I think what I'll do is I'll turn proceedings over to Rolando for his talk on tackling the drug cartels and the strategic challenges and opportunities for Mexico's new government. So please join me in welcoming Rolando. Hello. Um, well, first of all, Thank you, everyone, for being here on this fairly uh, wintry afternoon. I, I've heard it, I, was, I wasn't outside, but I heard it was pretty nasty. So uh, even better, and thank you for, you for coming. Um, thank you to Anglas for not only having me as, uh, as a visiting um, uh, fellow, but also for inviting me to, the, uh, to give this talk. It's always uh, nice and challenging to, to, to be able to stand in front of uh, an audience and talk about these issues. Uh, also, thanks to Sean for the more than stellar introduction. Uh, I hope he hasn't set your expectations up too high. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'll also apologize if I have to cough. I, I have uh, two sick children at home, so uh, that just means that you know I, I have to cough every once in a while. But I, I apologize in advance. Um, okay, so we are going to be talking today about, as uh, Sean mentioned. Um, tackling the cartels. Um, it's an issue that has become particularly relevant uh, in Mexico and in other areas of the world, in the entirety of Latin America, uh, for sure. 
So we're going to be talking about that. Uh, as many of you know, Mexico just changed governments. So we are going to be talking about that as well. Um, so if we just um, begin, um, we're going to be talking about in during this, this time, and I have to say, uh, just as a brief introduction, I think it's important that we open the, the floor out uh, for discussion. I'm much more interested in conversing than just talking. So I'm, I'm going to um, try to give a <coughs> sort of brief overview uh, where we take stock of the current situation in Mexico. We assess the magnitude of the violence. A lot of us have heard about it, talked about it. So we're going to, if, if, if we can um, fit it in, talk a little bit about what's going on there in terms of how violence uh, has affected the country, what the violence realities are. Um, we are also going to try to understand how this new change of government opens uh, certain doors for uh, new policy ideas, for new policy implementations regarding security. Uh, we're going to also be making a preliminary assessment of what has been done so far uh, from this government, knowing that the government just took uh, possession in, um, in January. So there's, there's not a lot to work on, but we're going to try to talk about that. And also, uh, importantly, I think we can talk about constructing this notion of um, what directions Mexico can take uh, moving forward. Um, just as a, another note, this is obviously a huge topic. It's not a topic that can easily fit into a, a short seminar. So uh, I will apologize for the brevity and perhaps the uh, seemingly superficiality of uh, some of the topics that we, we touch upon. Um, we can also, uh, the, at the end, talk about you know, ways in which we can, we can um, delve a little deeper into, um, into the subject. But we're going to try to keep it, keep it simple and fluid. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Mexico, I'm just going to go through it really quickly. There it is. Uh, the US to the north, Canada, I'm sorry, Canada, Guatemala, and, uh, and Belize to the, sorry. <laughs> um, Guatemala and Belize to the south. Uh, uh, there it is. As you can see, huge border with the US. Mexico, in a nutshell, we have a population of around 112 million people. Uh, we are a federal country with 31 states, uh, well, 30 and a federal district, if you want to be dogmatic about it, and around 2,500 municipalities. Our municipalities, um, I say our because I'm Mexican, um, range, they, they run the entire gamut of, of municipalities as far as uh, size, composition is concerned. We have municipalities that count among the richest municipalities in the in the hemisphere, or, or even the world, you could say, like uh, some of the municipalities we have in the north of the country. We also have uh, municipalities in the south, for example, that also count as some of the poorest in the region and uh, perhaps the world as well. We are safely nudged in the middle uh, income countries right now. We have a GDP of about 1.5 trillion, which uh, is uh, fairly substantial. We are the 14th largest economy in the world. Just a comparison, Australia is uh, 13, so we're just right there behind, uh, behind Australia, um, except we have about five times more people, but you know, uh, that's just uh, one of the difference. In terms of HDI, we are also uh, sort of middle of the pack, um, uh, in 61st place out of all the uh, countries that the UNDP measures, um, which is uh, not too bad. We do have high inequality, and that's uh, an issue that we can talk about. Um, we have a uh, Gini coefficient that is one of the highest in the world, um, the region itself, Latin America, suffers, as most of you probably know, uh, from inequality uh, to a very high degree. It's one of the most unequal places, uh, regions in the world. So that's more or less uh, Mexico. Um, what do we know now about organized crime? When you read the news, when you turn on your TV, when you read the magazines, there is this generalized vision of Mexico as uh, a place with a lot of violence, a uh, certain lack of governability, drug trade, corruption, etc., etc. There's violence, insecurity, uh, kidnapping, um, extortion, etc., etc. There's always the news about you know the thousands and thousands of dead people that we have counted um, in the last few years, uh, 50,000 more or less between 2006 and 2011, which is a fairly high uh, number uh, of people. It's uh, much higher now, and you know the, the unofficial figure probably stands to be a lot. Higher. On the sort of more radical side of the spectrum, we hear voices from certain um, uh, figures of opinion, uh, etc., etc., who, you know, have even fielded the idea that Mexico is on the verge of being a failed state, that there are these 
parallel states where um, um, where organized crime sort of rules uh, with their own rules and regulations. And also we keep hearing this catchphrase of the war on drugs, the war on drugs, the war on drugs, which, um, as I mentioned in the slide there, has been a very costly war in terms of money. And this is just an example of the amount of money that has been invested on it. The Plan Colombia, which is a plan, as the name says, to help Colombia um, deal with its organized crime issues, um, stands at about $7.5 billion. The Mexican version, called the Plan Merida, uh, is at about $1.5 billion. And that's only monetary cost. Obviously, there's other costs uh, assigned. Going a little bit back to, um, to um, way back, Mexico's relationship with drugs has been an ongoing issue. Uh, since the 1900s, there is evidence that back then we were already producing a substantial amount of uh, marijuana, which was being exported um, mostly to the U.S. Uh, there was a little bit of heroin production, not a lot, but there was a little bit done um, that was also supplying the U.S. market. And the first trafficking routes were also started uh, around that time. Uh, obviously, you have, to, um, you have to think about, you know, back at that time, it was pretty difficult to move uh, goods around. Mexico, this north northern part of Mexico towards the border with the U.S. is a desert. Um, so as, as uh, being in Australia, you understand how difficult it can be to move goods there. And you can imagine the 1900s anyway, they were doing that then. Um, as a response to an increase in uh, consumption in the U.S. around the 1960s uh, of all kinds of drugs, there is an explosion in the drug market um, in, in Mexico, but in the rest of Latin America. Um, this is basically where you, know, you start seeing organizations and groups of people who are making a lot of cash on the drug trade. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in 1969, as a response to this influx of drugs into the US, President Nixon um, implements what would be considered the first sort of border operation in terms of policy, drug policy. Uh, it was called the uh, Operation Intercept. Um, and then in 1973, as a further reaction to this increasingly sort of serious problem that they were facing, uh, the DEA is created. In 1975, uh, just a few years after that, Mexican authorities uh, implement what was then known as Operación Condor, which basically destroys local production. Uh, they use a lot of military force. We have to remember that in 1975, uh, Mexico's uh, government was very highly centralized. It controlled... Uh, held a very tight political and, and socioeconomic control over the territory and its population. So uh, they had a response fielded by the army and um, destroyed a lot of the local um, production. At this same time, Colombian organizations were beginning to gain more and more economic and, and, and um, sort of organizational power in terms of moving drugs. They were producing and controlling most of the production of cocaine at the time. Um, as you probably know, the two big cartels in Colombia are formed around this time. Um, the Medellin cartel and the Cali cartel uh, are basically the pr two prime examples of um, these organizations. So sort of very, these are the very traditional sort of um, <coughs> organized crime groups that are uh, moving drugs at the time. Uh, alongside them, there's also the armed groups and paramilitary groups in Colombia. Um, which, as we know from a lot of research and evidence that we have gathered uh, over decades, they have also um, they also began at some point to benefit from the drug trade. Um, so they they have all those organizations that are uh, doing that. Then Pablo Escobar is killed by police. Uh, as many of you know, he was the, the head of the Medellin cartel, very notorious narco in the sort of more traditional sense of, of the narco, who was you know kind of a big magnanimous uh, figure, sort of this larger than life individual who you know, took care of his community and um, was involved in politics and all kinds of things. Um, his fortune was estimated then at about $3 billion. In 2000, Plan Colombia is launched as a joint initiative between the governments of the U.S. and Colombia um, to aid Colombia in, in um, tackling the issue of the drug cartels. They have a, a series of successes, actually. Uh, they do manage to <coughs> sort of eviscerate the, uh, the cartels there, uh, levels of violence in Colombia also decrease uh, during that time. Uh, what that has is, 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 a, is a special effect because at this, uh, this uh, same time, Mexican cartels are gaining more and more, not only experience, but power within the drug trade. Uh, 
Um, evidence suggests that this happened because they used to be subcontracted by the Colombians, um, by the Colombian organizations, um, in terms of moving the, the, the cocaine into the, into the U.S. market. Uh, there's evidence that suggests that they were at some point being paid in cocaine, which then they sold, um, making themselves a lot of money. So they start gaining more, more and more power, and as the, uh, as the um, Colombian organizations are decimated through, granted, effective state action, um, the Mexican uh, organizations start gaining more, uh, more notoriety. <clears throat> and today they, they control a fair bit of the, um, of the transport of, of cocaine and other drugs. Um, to the rest uh, of the world. Um, just as a little parenthesis here, we're going to look at uh, production. More or less, as you can see, there's about uh, a thousand uh, or so tons of uh, cocaine produced in the three main countries that produce it: Bolo Bolivia, Colombia, and Bolivia, Colombia, and Peru. Um, most of the uh, cocaine is produced in those three countries. Um, most of the cocaine ends up in the U.S. and uh, Western Europe. Uh, it's uh, been noted lately that the U.S. and Western Europe are now sort of even in terms of the consumption of cocaine. It used to be that the U.S. Um, um, consumed a lot more, but now it's sort of uh, Europe's taken, taken uh, not the lead, but at least it's caught up with the U.S. in terms of consumption of, of cocaine and other drugs. Uh, in terms of marijuana, uh, as measured by seizures uh, in tons, as you can see there's a lot being seized. Uh, in Mexico, according to you know DC. Now, uh, as you know, and, and when I quote these numbers, it's important to make a little sort of methodological parenthesis, uh, and I won't bore you with, 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 with methodology, but um, as you know, crime and crime proceeds, uh, all those things are illegal. So it's in the best interest of those who engage in this to keep everything secret, which is why we know so little about, uh, about the drug trade and about any other illicit activities. Um, some of the hardest things that, uh, that I've been engaged with is actually trying to uh, debate and engage with other academics and researchers and policymakers into how do we know the extent of the problem. Well, the, the point is probably that we don't and we never will know the extent of the problem, but we do know and we have some certain proxies um, to know how uh, big the problem is, how small the problem might be. Um, seizures is a good measure of, um, of the drug trade. Now that doesn't mean, as you probably uh, can guess, that Mexico produced those, uh, that amount of, uh, of marijuana. It just means that it was seized there. It gives us an estimate, it gives us a number to work with, but uh, all numbers related to crime, and uh, that's a good thing to keep in mind when you hear you know, your political leaders or other people talking about you know, what we know, what we don't know about crime, is, is that this, crime is a very difficult thing to, to know about, especially when we want to measure it. Um, <clears throat> especially organized crime, which is particularly secretive. Um, so um, there it is. Um, uh, a sort of side effect of the uh, hardening of the cocaine market because of the war on drugs, um, we have seen a substantial increase in the production and consumption of methamphetamine. Um, methamphetamine is a pretty easy uh, drug to make. It can be made uh, almost anywhere. Uh, you know, it's, it's, not, not, it's not very complicated, which is why it's, um, you have all this uh, the issue with meth labs, uh, which I believe, for example, Australia has uh, had some issues with that as well. Um, Mexico has become a pretty significant producer of, of methamphetamine, unfortunately. Um, there has been policy responses to that. Uh, one of them was the outright ban on uh, certain medications that contained um, pseudoephedrine, which was... Uh, uh, an agent to make uh, methamphetamine, which has resulted in a decrease. However, you know, it is a problem that um, people are facing. And actually, it's also a problem that many consumer countries, like uh, the US, like Australia, like uh, Canada, are also facing, because they are beginning to see that there is a production of methamphetamine in their own countries for local, um, for local consumption. And that is a problem that um, a lot of the authorities in those countries are, are, are needing to deal with. Um, because of the health and, and criminal issues related to that. Um, so that's more or less where we stand in terms of the Mexican cartels. Uh, there's this map that's produced by a, a security consultant, so uh, that's kind of a caveat, so take it with a grain of salt. I think it illustrates, and I underline the word illustrates, sort of how these organizations are distributed. Some of them are uh, stronger, weaker, 
etc., etc. What I want to point out is two things. If you forget about the colors and the names, etc., etc., um, we do see that uh, they are mostly concentrated along the coast uh, of Mexico, both the coast of the Gulf and the Pacific coast, and obviously um, the U.S. border sort of towards the west. Um, so as you can see, they're concentrated along the, along the edges, um, the coast, which is obviously easier for, for trafficking. So that's one of the things that uh, we, can, we can think about, how this geographical distribution of the, of the, of the organized crime groups that uh, deal, deal in drugs are, are structured. Um, I also want you to notice that uh, Mexico City seems to be sort of stuck there in the middle uh, of the white, um, which might lead someone to think that you know, there's, we don't have uh, organized crime problems there. Um, there is organized uh, crime in Mexico City, um, <clears throat> fortunately for those of us who, who live there, uh, myself uh, included, it has somehow, at some point, escaped this very violent dynamic that other cities such as Monterrey in the north have had uh, to face in, 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 in recent years. That has a lot to do with the geographical location of Mexico City being, as you can see, in the middle of the city, in the city, sorry, in the middle of the country, um, which doesn't make it very practical to, to move drugs through. Um, it's also very heavily policed. Mexico City has one of the biggest police forces in the world uh, in terms of one single corporation. It's, I don't remember the number, but it's, 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 it's very, very big. Um, and also, and this is very important, it has a very low consumption rate. Mexico has a very low consumption rate, which is why also there is not a bigger problems that we already have. And that is, is, it's important to remember that. I think there's something like 4% compared to something like 14 or more more in, in, in the US, for example. Um, so Mexico City has kind of been isolated itself uh, because of that, which doesn't mean there's no violence there, which doesn't mean there's no crime in Mexico. Um, my, uh, my PhD research was on kidnapping in Mexico City, and, and there was a fair bit of that going on there. So, you know, it's, it, but it has been isolated from that, uh, from that dynamic. Um, so what have been the policy responses to this problem? On the international level, there's been the famous war on drugs. Um, this term, this, this idea, was first fielded during the Reagan administration in the US. Um, it has gone through a number of other iterations since then. Um, pretty much every US president since then has had a, a version of it, which has involved, obviously, a bunch of different um, international actors. The results of that, well, we're going to talk about that. Um, there is a, a growing consensus that the approach has largely failed, uh, and we can discuss that uh, um, deeper uh, in a bit. Um, again, just quickly, Plan Colombia and Plan Merida, as, uh, as we have seen, are also big international investments that have been made in, into the war on drug effort. Um, in Colombia, as, uh, as we said, there has been a, a reduction of violence that we have seen in, in Colombia, which is a very good result, being that Colombia had a, uh, a very high level of homicide, for example. Uh, and there has been a stabilization of cocaine production as well. Now, we do not know if this has to do with um, Plan Colombia or with the fact that consumption has also seems to be stabilizing around the world. So it could be uh, either of those. Again, it's, it's hard to know also the effects of these, um, these programs because they're so broad and uh, try to tackle so many issues at the same time. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Plan Merida, which was more recent, again, um, we still have to see uh, if that has had any results. Uh, so far, they've used up about $600 million uh, US in technical assistance and hardware. Those have been sort of the big, larger policy responses that we've seen. Um, in terms of what Mexico did and the sort of issue that we are discussing tonight, um, a few days after his inauguration, uh, President Calderón basically launched a drug policy. A drug policy that involved uh, a fair amount of repression, a fair amount of repressive force, um, a fair amount of the use of military force, and uh, a sort of let's go get them mentality, which was very brave of him to do, which was a, a great idea in principle. But you know, there seems to be a, a consensus among uh, experts and, and, and other people that it was a bit ill-informed, uh, um, that idea. Um, so uh, what happened was a heavy, heavy militarization of, uh, of the entire country, uh, 
pockets of uh, certain places more so than others. There was a um, very increased presence of the Marines and uh, the, sorry, the Navy and the Army. There was also uh, a strengthening of the federal police, uh, which went from I think 6,000 to about 30,000 officers in that in the period from 2000 to 2000, sorry 2006 to 2012. So it was a huge increase in the sort of force of the state, and uh, they did uh, go after them in terms of where they went in the territory. Um, but not much else happened. There was laws passed, the victim's law, there was uh, a lot of other efforts, but mainly it was focused around repression. And that's what um, people believe, uh, myself included, and that's, that's my opinion, is that um, the approach uh, was, was a bit um, not very well, well thought out because of what we're going to see now, which is basically the results of, um, of this policy. The homicide rates in Mexico per 100,000 people jumped from 8.5 in 2007 to 23 in 2011. That is a, a very substantial increase, which puts it uh, on one of the highest levels uh, within Latin America. Uh, for comparison, I believe Brazil's uh, right now is around 21 or 22. Um, Colombia, I believe, it's actually now a little bit higher than that. And well, the, the countries in Central America, which are suffering at the moment from a particularly um, serious uh, problem with homicide, are more around in the 60s um, or sometimes up to the 80s. Um, consumption, as I mentioned, remains mostly equal throughout the world. Uh, there's small variations. Some countries have seen declines. Uh, I believe actually Australia has seen a, a decline in, in consumption, which is one of the only. Uh, uh, developed nations to have seen that uh, recently, as far as I can remember. Production remains mostly equal, except for methamphetamine, which you have seen an increase in. And at uh, the last count, there was about 70,000 people uh, dead as a direct response uh, to this um, to this policy approach, repressive policy approach. Um, there's been studies done in Mexico as well that show that you know, jails have normally now been populated with uh, more petty dealers. There's a, a huge increase in people who are doing jail time um, because, you know, being caught with a small amount of drug that they were selling on the streets, etc., etc. And granted, to the credit of the uh, of the um, of the policy, uh, some heads of the cartels were uh, effectively captured and or killed. Um, so there has been a certain weakening of certain um, organizations, which has also resulted in a. a sort of a perverse dynamic of strengthening certain others, um, <coughs> which also seem to have increased the level of violence. Um, now, uh, we come to the present. We had elections last year. Um, the incumbent party, the National Action Party, after 12 years in power, lost the presidency uh, to, the, to the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, um, Institutional, Institutional Revolutionary Party which had been in power up until the year 2000 and had been in power for around 70 odd years. Um, there was a big democratic quality jump up into the year 2000 when you know, a, an opposition party for the first time since our um, revolution, since the 20s, came to power. Um, however, the, the PRI is now back in power. And you know, it's fair to say that it is probably in a, in a significant way to do with the failures of the security policy of the previous administration. The new um, president, Enrique Peña Nieto, campaigned heavily on the premise of changing the approach, campaigned heavily on the premise of providing um, safety. Uh, safety, by the way, has become the primordial concern of people in many Latin American countries, surpassing by many surveys uh, reckoning, surpassing the economy, surpassing jobs. Um, it has become the key uh, preoccupation of, of the population in many countries in, in Latin America. So we are talking about a serious uh, issue there. Um, what has he proposed? Um, there's an intersecretarial commission that he has named, um, the administration has named, which includes uh, I think it's about nine secretaries of state, health, gobernación, which is kind of the interior minister, um, Hacienda, which does uh, income and taxes, education, economy, labor, um, I believe uh, communications, etc., etc., to coordinate their, their mandate is to coordinate um, the agenda of security. 
Uh, it has also uh, planned to implement a national program for violence and crime prevention, which includes a national prevention program, uh, a penal code, which seems to be because uh, in Mexico there's many penal codes, where each state has its own penal code. And then the Federation has another one, so it's a bit of a conflict there, <coughs> as you can imagine. Uh, there's the implementation of the victim's law, which we can discuss its, its, its uh, sort of use uh, at this time. Uh, there's a version that was already there. There's a proposition as well as of a sort of gendarmeria style uh, police force, which will be kind of, we don't really know yet, but could be kind of an elite-ish uh, corporation which would go into um, um, places where uh, they deem that it's most needed. Um, there is uh, talk of strengthening the federal police from, I believe, up to 50,000 um, um, policemen and women. And uh, the application of the existing penal reform, which was done um, a few years back, really in 2005, uh, to expedite the change to the oral accusatory system. Right now what we have is a paper-based system um, in our criminal justice system, which, uh, as we can discuss if you want, makes um, a huge uh, lag of paper, stacks and stacks of paper everywhere. And so there, there has been a pilot uh, for that law, which was actually uh, implemented in the state where the now president was governor before. So the, the agenda that he has to push this uh, reform to change the entirety of the uh, trials, criminal trials in Mexico to the oral uh, accusatory system, so to a much more uh, US style, kind of a law and order uh, style uh, of, of, of trials. Those are the proposals. Um, are they good or bad? I, I think it remains to be seen right now. Um, it's very early to know whether or not they will actually be implemented, how they will be implemented, and if they are going to have any results. These are some of the proposals. These are some of the more salient proposals. Um, I believe that you know it's positive to see that there is, uh, for example, prevention um, uh, put on the agenda by the president. That's uh, nominally a good thing. Um, it remains to be seen whether that's going to translate into actual policy, which is always the, the, the largest challenge uh, for any policymaker, and especially in, in terms of safety and security. You know, the implementation uh, part of that. Um, we, we, we have to, to wait and see how that's gonna, gonna pan out. Um, you know, we see a bit of new things. The national, as I say, the prevention program, unifying the penal code uh, might be a good idea. It depends what they decide to put in that penal code. Um, <clears throat> um, the Gendarmería creating more um, police forces, well, there's debate of whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, depending on the quality. There's evidence from other countries, for example, that an increase in uh, particularly the U.S., which is a different context, granted, that an increase in a number of police officers does bring about a reduction in crime, but only to a certain point. After a certain point, it ceases to be effective, and there's a lot of statistical uh, evidence from, uh, that says that. So there's only a limited amount of good that more policemen can do, particularly if we think about the context of Mexico and a lot of the Latin American region where you know, uh, there seems to be some... Um, some gaps in the training of uh, police officers and the training of uh, people within the justice system. A lot of efforts are being made, that's for sure, in, in many countries, uh, Mexico included, but uh, a lot remains to be done. Um, the new reform, the, the, the change to oral, uh, to oral trials, uh, is an experiment that started in Chile uh, in the late 90s, I believe, and it has since um, been adopted by a number of, of activists and, and, and lawyers in Mexico who, were, who are and were pushing for this reform. Um, the reform is in place. We are looking forward to seeing what the results are of actually implementing it. Uh, the state of the Estado de Mexico, which is where the, from where the president comes, has had this uh, program implemented with good results, actually. I was lucky to be part of a research team evaluating the transition there, and uh, some of the results that we saw were <coughs> were actually um, were actually positive. So that's something that we have to look forward to, and to see if it actually works um, as as it, as it was intended. There is always a debate as to whether or not you know this change is just going to make you know more of the same go through different channels, or if it's actually going to make um, a difference. This, uh, as I say, and uh, I apologize for not bringing more answers, and uh, maybe we can have another seminar at the end of the year where we can assess the impact of this. Uh, as I said, the president just took um, office in, in January, so we're still only about three months, um, December? This, December, December, sorry, yes, December, why January? 
Um, do you have time? Uh, I'm, ju I'm almost done. Um, there's a few angles to consider, and I think I'm just going to put it out there. Uh, I believe, and this is, again, my opinion, and I concur with other uh, sort of uh, analysts and academics, that the war on drugs, as we know it now, is unsustainable. Um, it has not really generated uh, positive impacts that justify uh, the expenditure. Um, there is this issue of uh, shared but differentiated responsibility that a lot of countries have been pushing for, particularly drug producing countries who are trying to see more eye to eye uh, with consumer countries in the sense that well, you know, we are both responsible for what is going on, even though you know, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the cost of violence is, is paid mostly, not all of it, but mostly in the producing countries. And uh, since uh, um, Sean mentioned it uh, at the INCAF conference that I attended just a few months ago, that was one of the biggest things that we were talking about, is how do we deal with this issue of shared but differentiated responsibility between countries that are involved in the drug trade. And uh, this is a document that I think is important to point out, the Global Commission on Drug Policy that has made uh, very important recommendations for the region. Uh, and this is kind of revolutionary in the sense that it hasn't been said before, and it was said also by people who are prominent there. It was first started by a group of ex-presidents, now it has been adopted by acting presidents of the region, uh, which um, basically is very critical of the approach of the war on drugs, and basically uh, makes those proposals, obviously much more complex than I'm putting in there, uh, about decriminalization, legal regulation of drugs, and most importantly, to approach, approach the issue as a public health problem. Uh, I believe the Australian uh, drug strategy does that, and I think it does it well. Uh, so I think there's something that could be, uh, could be um, looked into from there. Um, as usual, things we can't ignore, and it's, uh, people like, like, like myself, sometimes we get tired of mentioning it, but that's something we need to be uh, working on, and we are working on it, and a lot of countries in Latin America are working on this, which is poverty, dealing with inequality, dealing with institutional weaknesses. Uh, the country like Mexico has very, very deeply ingrained um, uh, weaknesses within the architecture of our institutions, particularly in the case of Mexico, the criminal justice system, which is, uh, you know, ineffective and, and has a lot of issues in terms of how it deals with crime. We have a very high rate of uh, sort of non, non punishment of crime. We have a lot of impunity, and again, uh, uh, just to, to cap it off, the rule of law. Um, there is no point in making more laws, as we have argued many times, if we don't have the mechanisms, the institutional mechanisms to apply these laws and make sure that they are applied fairly. Not just applied, but also applied fairly. And that is something that the next administration and anyone else who's interested in that has to work towards uh, in Mexico and any other country where that has those, uh, those issues is the issue of, uh, of how do you implement the rule of law. Mexico. We have the laws, we have the, 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 uh, the ideas, but you need to actually um, have the strength and the capacity, institutional capacity to implement them. And that requires uh, deep structural reforms that are not easy to implement and that are extremely challenging in terms of the time frame that they take up. Um, so with that, I'll just thank you and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll open it up for any, any discussion and any uh, more in-depth uh, ideas that you might have, if there's time. <coughs> Thank you. The traditional approach to, uh, to, to the drug trade was to, as I said, treat it as a crime. Uh, it, it treated users as, cr as criminals, criminalized users as much as dealers, producers. So it was seen through the, through the, through the lens of, of, of the criminal justice system in terms of breaking uh, laws. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, switching that approach to a public health one, uh, as, as, as I mentioned before, has a number of advantages. On the one hand, uh, it doesn't mean that you don't criminalize certain people, but you stop criminalizing people who are arguably should not be criminalized, like users, for example. And we can debate whether they should or not, that depends on a lot of sort of which end of the policy spectrum and ideological spectrum even you, you, you're standing. Um, but as, as, as numbers also show, for example, in the case of Mexico, uh, a lot of users end up in jail. And you know, it, it's a lot of used resources, there's a lot of uh, waste of energy uh, 
because you know there's an administrative cost of persecuting these people. There's a, there's a cost of keeping them in jail. Um, when really the effect that they have on sort of the overall climate of violence of drug use is not significant. So treating it as a, as a health issue tackles those tackles those issues without necessarily criminalizing the the user. It also rests heavily on certain decriminalization of certain soft drugs like uh, like cannabis, for example, and it also allows for uh, resources to be channeled to actually going after more organized or, uh, more organized organizations sorry <laughs> uh, more organized groups who are uh, responsible for for the dealing in drugs it does require uh, a very sort of uh, open interpretation of, 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 of and, and I guess it requires to sort of institute a sort of uh, a sort of uh, policy amnesia because there's a huge tradition of criminalizing drugs uh, it's sort of very black and white. You know, drugs bad, people who are anywhere near them bad, we, they should all be in jail. That was kind of the, the, uh, the very sort of, in a nutshell, uh, approach. Uh, the health issue deals with the problems also in terms of how, the, how drugs affect communities, families, but it does so, if it's done properly, in a much more caring way. You know, drugs do destroy families, drug abuse, uh, substance abuse, uh, does affect families as well. Approaching it from a public health perspective brings in, you know, doctors, nurses, uh, social services, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's a bit more, sort of the, the notion. And, and and really, I think um, looking at the Australian um, strategy, drug strategy is a good idea if you're interested in this topic, because I think at least in the in their proposals, uh, they do it. Uh, they put it pretty succinctly. Um, I um, I think it's fairly. Um, well, I don't want to say widespread because it's 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 not as widespread as it seems. <laughs> the levels of violence, is that if that's what you're referring to, uh, from the north to the south don't really vary. There's there's high levels of violence in the south. There's high levels of violence in the north. What um, what I think needs to be clarified as well, and that's something we I mentioned before, is is as you say, you see all these images and, and all of that. And I think it's important to say that uh, a lot of the violence is very concentrated. And it's concentrated in a very fairly small amount of municipalities. I think it's about 120 out of 2,500, where most of the drug violence happens. So, you know, when you see this, this idea of, of, of Mexico as being sort of this wild west, you know, um, uh, of violence, we need, we need to take into account that there's a lot of spatial geographical variation about that. Um, there is violence, you know, in other, in other parts. Drug violence is, is kind of localized. And that, that, does, that obviously doesn't justify it, but it also uh, contextualizes this a little bit um, in terms of where it is. But yeah, the intensity, there is north-south, is, there's, not a, there's not a variation in terms of that, I don't think. Um, a lot of it has to do with where they are uh, in terms of their path through a trafficking route. It has to do with certain institutional characteristics of those municipalities. Um, it has to do with you know, the availability of services in law enforcement. Um, uh, it has to do with, you know, uh, the, the kind of the local dynamic of law enforcement in other places. The, 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 the explanation is very complex, you know, because there, there's many actors involved there. There's the drug cartels, of course, involved, and there's the government, you know, there's also kind of civil society trapped in the middle. So um, there's, uh, what I would say, a lot of it is, is, you know, spatial and structural as well from those municipalities. Yeah. Um, to, to begin with, the... Uh, the debate about uh, decriminalization, so that, like the, the sort of lingo is more decriminalization rather than um, legalization in terms of, uh, and that has to do with the, um, the report I, I mentioned, um, the Global Convention on Drug Policy. Uh, that was a very big driver there, and uh, I'm very familiar with it. And <clears throat> um, the issue in Mexico, there's not really any, um, su any significant debate, at least at the policy level, about that. Um, for many reasons, a lot of them are political. Uh, some of them could be, you know, related to other um, local factors, um, uh, international relations as well matter in that sense. So there really isn't a, a, a debate on that uh, as of yet. Um, there are certain voices that are pushing for it. There are certain, you know, uh, the uh, former president Cedillo was one of the uh, main orchestrators of this uh, drug policy report. 
So he's, he's definitely one of the people who was endorsing it, um, which is significant, you know, uh, him being a former president. Um, more than that, I don't think there's, there's, there's any way right now, realistically, that Mexico is going to move towards um, decriminalizing. Uh, I think there might be some mechanisms instituted in some form within the prevention agenda that could equate to that, but formally, no. And in terms of the um, um, cooperation, I think um, that, is, that is one of the biggest uh, issues that the drug trade uh, and people who work in policy face now. There is, as you say, there's producers, transits, and, uh, and you know, consumer countries and regions. Those three actors have very different dynamics, very different political scenarios, very different uh, criminal dynamics. So they have to deal with those things, but they are also dependent on all the others. And <clears throat> as I said in this, in this conference that we, that we worked in, one of the things that uh, uh, these people who work on these subjects are finding increasingly challenging is how do you cooperate? Because by cooperating, you also have to admit that you have a certain stake in this and a certain responsibility. Um, there has been some uh, bigger efforts, and I think part of the uh, Global Commission um, uh, drive was to sort of level the playing field a little bit and, and, and try to make producing countries uh, or, or developing countries sort of more important actors and decision makers within international drug policy. It remains to be seen what um, effect this is going to have. But what I can say is that it is a positive development that the people are actually discussing this in international fora and they're discussing this in international policy circles, which means there's you know, a door that's being opened towards uh, better responsibility, which is eventually going to mean better cooperation. Um, and, that's, and that applies to Ecuador as a transit country as well. Um, yeah, I, I can do that. Sorry, I, I should have actually uh, done that, but thanks for bringing it up. Um, my position about the failed state, as it applies to Mexico, is no, it doesn't work. Uh, for uh, there's a number of reasons, and, and the answer is, is a bit, it's a bit more uh, more complex. But basically, um, the, 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 the 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 persons who are pushing for the failed state issue, um, who are the seriously pushing for it, uh, are arguing that there's you know, failed state means you basically have no control over a portion or all of your territory. That's basically the premise of any failed state. Uh, then you can add on, on top of that a number of other variables. So basically the definition of one is that this state has no control over certain patches of the, of the, of the, of the territory. Uh, for better or worse, the Mexican state has control over the territory. And I say for better or worse because, you know, there, there's, um, there's important dynamics of organized crime that are obscured by this notion of, and that's my opinion, only my opinion, um, that are obscured by this notion of the failed state. It basically means you're either A or B. It doesn't let you go into the nuances and the mechanisms by which, for example, sometimes the state and organized crime interacts. Uh, you know, you, you, and you, you find, for example, in other countries as well as in Mexico, the state's there. It, it functions in, in, in strange ways and, and, and in, in complicated ways, and sometimes, you know, sometimes it's it's it, it's it's sort of conjoined with with organized crime. At times, it isn't, but the state is there in some form or another. The municipal president is there, the police, the municipal police is there. There is a state presence, and as and as far as they are concerned, they also respond to the needs of the state or the or the sort of larger sort of polity. Um, so I don't think. Uh, a is a useful. A in any case would be a useful way, no, not just to Mexico, but I think to apply it, uh, it's sexy, because you know it's it's something that <laughs> it's a concept that has been uh, used a lot because it sounds kind of uh, interesting and appealing. Um, but like I said, I think it obscures uh, even when you use it to describe states which could be classified as failed states. You know, states uh, in other regions where you know there is no state or states um, fundamentally weakened. It, my main uh, problem with it is that it obscures those nuances, it obscures the mechanisms by which if civil society, organized crime, uh, other groups, the state, all interact together because they're there. And in the case particular of Mexico, as I said, you know, the Mexican state's there and it's not about to collapse any time. Um, it has weaknesses, the institutions are, have problems, etc., of course, but um, I think classifying it as a failed state is a, is a mistake.
but that's just me. Most of Latin America consumption rates are fairly low compared to other regions, compared to North America, Western Europe. It's higher in certain countries uh, than others, um, but it is fair to say that uh, consumption rates are fairly low. If uh, all of a sudden, um, you know, consuming countries decided they didn't want it anymore, um, something happened that sort of made them do that. I, uh, you could say that a fair amount of the market would disappear. They would, they, it will remain. There would always be a sort of minimized local uh, local market. But I would, I do think that you know, in that hypothetical situation, uh, it would definitely have a huge impact if all of a sudden, uh, you know, Western Europe and, and the UN decided they didn't want to use it. Anymore. I think um, there's there's a bit of both. I think if, if and this is the problem with the shared but differentiated responsibility. If transit countries and consuming countries don't assume the responsibility they have in the drug trade, and it's not just the drug trade. You can talk about human trafficking, you can talk about any sort of international uh, crime, transnational organized crime, like they call it. If the countries where the goods go to, whether it's humans, stolen television, stolen cars, drugs, uh, uh, ivory, you name it, if those countries don't recognize that, the responsibility that they have, because eventually the product is being sold on their streets or on their markets, um, there won't be a chance for huge change. Uh, unilaterally, I think there's, there's not a lot of opportunity. I do think that some things can be made at the national level, so if nothing else changed. I think countries, uh, Latin American countries, producer countries, transit countries, could um, work on certain things that would do um, damage to the to the inter illegal trades. Uh, part of it would be institutional reform um, to work on, on on the criminal justice systems, the rule of law. Part of it would be also working on um, you know the public health uh, uh, issues. So building up national institutions that are strong and that are sort of resilient um, can have a sort of minimizing impact on. Uh, the damage that sort of transnational organized crime, let's just call it, can do in those countries. Without um, shared responsibility with other countries, it, it will be fairly hard to um, say because if the demand's there, there's always going to be. Um, and as we have seen uh, lately, you know, crime tends to move to other places. When you build up your institutions in one place, they just go to another one and they, they, seem, to be, uh, they seem to be fairly mobile. Also because, you know, uh, organized crime groups have changed a lot. They're not, you know, those traditional hierarchical ones that. Um, used to be around uh, in the 70s or 80s. They're now much more uh, sort of smaller and opportunistic. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's a little bit of both. But it's very important to underline the importance of shared responsibility between all the actors involved. And I think particularly as we move forward in terms of international policy, um, that's going to have to be addressed. Um, I think, as I say, Mexico and, uh, uh, for better or worse, Mexico and the U.S. are kind of... Um, you know, stuck together forever, and so there. You know, there's 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 a lot of uh, a lot of discussion about these programs, and and the same was I remember uh, at the time when Plan Colombia was being uh, implemented. There was a lot of debate in, and, and, and unrest in Colombia about this, and I remember at the time uh, talking to Colombian colleagues who were you know uh, uh, fairly incensed about this this idea of you know receiving money. Um, receiving money from the U.S., etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you know, kind of um, uh, being, again, this kind of almost imperialistic kind of uh, debate. Um, and the same was, as you say, uh, was seen uh, in terms of the Merida Initiative. Now, um, no, no country likes being told what to do, you know, whether it's Latin America, whether it's the U.S., Europe, uh, you know, and we, we see those debates about, you know, national agendas even in the European Union these days regarding, for example, the financial system and how it's supposed to be working. Um, having said that, there is also, you know, the responsibility of, uh, um, of the local government for accepting it. And that's something that we need to, to address as well. Uh, I think uh, it's important to recognize that local governments in Latin America and other parts of the world do have agency. Um, while, of course, there are countries who might be more economically or politically powerful, 
<coughs> excuse me, the um, countries in Latin America have agency, and we need to recognize that. So if we implement a plan and we, and we, and we receive aid in whichever form from the U.S., that's our responsibility. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, the, the countries can sort of, or in this case, in your example, the U.S. can say, oh, you, I want you to implement this. Uh, it's up to us whether we accept it or not. Uh, the government of Colombia accepted Plan, Medi Plan, sorry, Plan Colombia, just like the government of Mexico accepted um, uh, Plan Merida. And I think the, the important point there is, is that both governments are responsible for the implementation of that. Uh, so, yeah, it's not just, uh, you know, the U.S. telling us what to do. You know, we're, we're, we're equally responsible for whether or not we do it. It's 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 fairly new, and uh, and it, it brings me to also another uh, thing that's, that that you mentioned is very important, which is the money. Uh, not just the money we receive, as as, as you there said, uh, but also the money that is that is that is made by uh, by organized crime, and that takes us into a completely different uh, environment because you know there's there's uh, there's the financial institutions that engage in it, there's the financial actors that engage in it, and and, and, and all this money that's being generated by the legal industry is you know. Being, you know, spent, cleaned, laundered, moved. Uh, so one of the approaches that has been suggested uh, for tackling that, and that has to do also with the shared responsibility issue, is that you have to tackle the financial aspect. You know, it's it, it makes sense to say, okay, you know, you hit them when they hurt. If, you, if they can't do anything with money, with the money that's that's made illicitly, illicitly, then there's it may, doesn't make any sense. It makes them very, it makes it very expensive to engage in that activity. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, the shared responsibility issue is, 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 and I think it is a response to the sense of, um, which has been growing in other aspects as well, in Latin America, um, <clears throat> this kind of pushback against some sense of imposition. Uh, as the certification process, you know, the plan is many, the plan, plan Colombia, there was, there was not this kind of sense of, uh, of being imposed upon uh, that, you know, uh, that, that, that has been felt before. And I think this, this, new, this new path and these new ideas of, behind the Global Commission, et cetera, et cetera, come on the heels of that, uh, that sense that we are kind of the architects of our own future and we can, we can sort of deal eye to eye with, um, with you know, the donors or, or the U.S. or whoever is um, sort of sitting on the other side of the table. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's definitely differences between both, both, both initiatives. And um, like I said, before, you know, Mexican government uh, has some form of agency over, over how it uses the funds. Um, you know, we, we still do have to work with the institutions a, a fair bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely uh, a, different, a different scenario. There's differences between the two.